What's up everybody, it's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. Now today, we have the honor and privilege of being joined by DJ Evil Lee. Thanks for coming through, man. Oh man, my pleasure, bro. My hey, pleasure. Always love great that. to see you, DJ Evil Lee. Love so that. much going on. Yeah, uh, you're doing uh, a lot of work and stuff with, with Schooly D right now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you got the Ice-T legacy as well. Mm -hmm. So let's start with Schooly since you're working on some stuff with him now. Way back in the day, do you remember the first time that you would hear the PSK? Were you with Ice in Santa Monica when Absolutely. you guys heard it? Absolutely. So break I mean, down. We got, we got the... We got the um, we got influenced by the PSK song through Ice, through um, Schooly D, and that's how we got Six in the Morning. We took the cadence from PSK and flipped it in the, the Six in the Morning. That's where the whole the whole Six in the Morning came from. And NWA took our Six in the Morning from cruising down the street. Yeah, Boys in the Hood. So that's how that came about and stuff. But. So when you were first when you first heard PSK, what made it stand out so much to you? Why was it so remarkable? What he was talking about as far as the song, as far as um, um, the streets. And um, I mean, it, 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 it was so much closer to what we, we thought about as far as putting our record six in the morning together that we, we loved it so much. We took the whole song and a little bit of what he was talking about and put it in the L.A., in the, in the, in the world of L.A. Okay. That's what we did with that, you know, and turned it into six in the morning. And with that, now being, uh, being able and working with Schooly and doing lots of stuff with him now over the years, how would you say your relationship with him has evolved from getting to meet him back in the 80s to now in the 2020s? Well, when we did that show, we did a show with them a couple years ago in Jersey with Schooly. We did a show with Schooly. That's the first time I really, really had a conversation with him and met him personally. And that show was a great show. It was us, School. Cool Keith, Melly Mel and Score. Great show in Jersey. Wow. And then after that, we did the show in Huntington Park just recently. Yes. And um, and we, we put it together so quick. A lot of people thought we just was actually on tour doing that same set. But we, we did that in, in the sound check. Right. So, and I mean, me and myself, I'm always one of the people that when I get involved with an artist, like I was with Cool Keith for a long time, doing a tour with him. I put him on the war tour in 2000 with D12 with Kevin Lott. Kevin Lamy was the, um, the um, he was the, um, the tour manager, so he put us on, and and that's how it all went down with Schooly, man. I mean, he's a good dude. He's easy to work with. He's not complicated. You know, I got to work with people that make sense. That that's not gonna drive me crazy. So right. he's a good dude, man. Okay. Love that dude. Yeah. Okay. And then taking it back to Ice T and getting breaking through with Six in the Morning. Obviously, he had a lot of records out before that. Oh. Six in the morning was yeah we had we yeah, had several several so yeah. as, as you saw his music evolve as you saw things changing with ice what note what did you notice was the change of the reception with six in the morning versus cold wind madness or some of the earlier records well six in the morning six in the morning was was on Technohub, it was on an independent label. Right. And then we got signed from that label to Warner Brothers. Right. So anything before six in the morning, we did Dog in the Wax, yep. we did You Don't Quit, the same level as Technohub. And, and we took all of that to Warner Brothers. Seymour loved it, he signed us right away. Ice went in there with a whole story, and boom, we got signed and then took off of Warner Brothers, man, and signed Warner Brothers. Madonna's and, label, big. And given that techno hop and the electro hop and that Egyptian lover type of feel was dominating for so long, World Class Wrecking Crew. 80s, early 80s. Yes. Yeah. With, with all of that and then getting into what Ice ended up doing, popularizing gangster rap on the West Coast, what did you notice about how the fans were reacting differently to those two styles of music? Well, I mean, six in the morning, Kind of catered so fast. It went out. It took off so fast. Not only the West Coast, the Midwest, and New York. Everybody loved that song. And then when we put that song on the Ryan Pays album, with the car, the Porsche, and everything, it even made it bigger because it was a bigger entity. It had much, you know, we had a bigger label. It went more worldwide than it was on independent. So that's what took off with the whole six in the morning with um with the major label. You know, always when you get signed to major, major gonna take you all over the bubble. You know. As opposed to independent, they keep you around the block or whatever down here, down the street, locally. Right. You got to come out the trunk, you know. But yeah. And even back then, with the uh, Ron Pays, wasn't really videos like people got used to. Even starting with the Power album, 
So how was it breaking the record? Because uh, people now might not understand or appreciate the grind it would have been back in 86, 87 to get Ron Pays out there. So what did you notice or what did you really have to do to make sure that Ron Pays and the stuff you guys were doing was getting out there? Well, we had to do, of course, do concerts. And we did the Ryan Pays, we did the, the Dope Jam tour when that album came out. So we did that with Bismarck. I mean, actually, Bismarck. Um, it wasn't even Karis when it was, um, it was um, him and the whole crew, the Boogie Down Productions at the time, every Rock Kim, Doug Fresh, Public Enemy. And we toured with a police car on stage at Ryan Pays. Of course, you always, everybody got to understand that you make money touring. These labels were definitely pocketing most of your sales because they want their money back. It's like a loan, obviously, you know. So that's, that's where the whole thing of just being out there and getting the records more, you know, getting them and listening, to, getting people in the stores to buy the records. Okay. And then for you, at, at the time, how were you developing being a DJ? Because the sound of the Electro Hop, the Egyptian Lover, the World Class Record Crew is very different from what... What we put out. Uh, what you guys put out. So how did you evolve during this time in the... Me. The West Coast era? They yeah. call it the West Coast era. Yeah. Seeing me and being, being from New York. Exactly. As your hat And show. Islam. And <laughs> yes. African Islam came. Awesome. He, he's the one that actually was the producer of pretty much all the stuff we did in the beginning. So we got the feel from him and got related to all the MCs and DJs in New York before we did most of the people out here. So once New York accepted us, then boom, it was, a, it was to, the, to the moon after that. We took off. We got more accepted in New York more than we did out here. But when you moved out here, uh, did you? What was the difference of how DJs would scratch and mix compared to New York compared to out here? Well, I had a different feel. I started when I was 16, and I started in front of the projects. I was out there when Scratch was out there, when all the drama was at Theodore. All of them was out there. So it was a different Scratch technique. They would cut a little more quicker. They would use faster records as opposed to me. We was always on the mellow side, the funk side, or the hip hop drum beats. That's, that's what we came with. That's why I took that to LA from New York, made it happen. People got, it, uh, got excited about it because they never really heard it. Because they kept hearing Egyptian, Love, Bobcat, Battle Cat. And then when I came in there, I changed the whole game, man, with the New York vibe. And got me and Ice connected, LA, New York. Right. And with that too, speaking of that, you had uh, the Mix Masters, and given that rap had uh, obviously radio shows in New York before with uh, Red Alert in particular, Mr. Magic, etc., but coming out here and having K-Day with a 24-hour station, what was that like coming from New York where everything was moving, but actually hearing it 24 hours a day on the West Coast? It was a big deal. We had a lot of artists out here from JJ Fab to Rodney Ocho Cooley, I mean the list goes on and we had Tali T, we had all our West Coast people and and um, shout out to Greg Mack, he's the one that made that happen. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have no K there. Of course, check my interview with Greg Mack right there. Shout out to Greg Mack Shout always. out to Greg Mack, the Mack Attack, K Day. Yeah. Back in the day, fifteen eighty AM at that. Yes. Yeah. Big deal.